Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host, Seishu, and I am here with David Dushemin, a photographer based in Vancouver, British Columbia. Now, as you know, I speak with photography industry leaders who make it a habit of inspiring others, bridging craft and commerce to help you create a sustainable and creative business. David is the epitome, in my mind, of just that. Somebody who's done that so well that I awarded him the first Tiffin Box Award for uh, being a teacher, being a photographer, being a being just a cool guy online. Um, his humility and generosity is what really piques my interest every single time I see an email from him. Uh, it's really about teaching and serving others, and I really, you know, every time every time he posts something on his on his website, which you must all take a look at, by the way, it's unlike any other photographer's website in my mind because it's all about teaching and, and really sharing what he knows and what he's experienced. Welcome to the show, David. Hey, thanks, Seishu. Um, David, I'm going to jump right in and say this, or ask you this. Uh, your latest book is called The Soul of the Camera. And a lot of people uh, probably looking at that title initially would probably think, what's he talking about? What is he really trying to say? And it doesn't take a genius to really understand that you're talking about the photographer, really, about that, that is behind the camera, that is actually creating these photographs, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, is, it has taken me a long, long time, and I, I'm assuming a lot, of, a lot of photographers feel this way as well, that initially it is about the gear, it is about... The lenses it is about the flash systems and all that cool stuff and one thinks uh, erroneously that uh, those are the things that make the photograph while ultimately it is the photographer the photographer is in charge of it in charge of it all and you say one thing in your blurb on online on, on Amazon you say uh, that you believe the majority of our images fall short because they lack soul. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty bold statement. Yeah, it is, but I, uh, but I stand by it. <laughs> I think ultimately it's one thing to get a sharp photograph. It's one thing to get a well-exposed photograph. And those things are important. Craft is important. And yes, you're right. At the beginning, it is about the gear because your however much vision you have it can only go as far as your craft is able to carry it so that part's important and we do spend uh at the beginning an inordinate amount of time learning that stuff that's important where we fail is to realize hey i'm competent now i can focus i can expose my photographs are sharp to you know to greater or lesser degree now what do what is my responsibility for building a photograph that tells a story, that has poetry about it, that, that moves people? A good photograph is not the same as a well-exposed, sharp photograph. Once in a while, the two coincide, but there's always got to be something more. There's got to be something that, and I call it soul, but soul, life, spark, whatever it is, there's got to be something that, that makes you go, mm, right? It, whether that's uh, information or whether it's impact right. there's got to be something more than you know no one's gonna sit around and go wow that guy was he made the sharpest pictures ever right we don't say that I mean imagine all of the people in photographic history that we talk about these icons we're not talking about how sharp their photographs are how uh, how great their histograms are we are talking about the content and how it has moved us how what our experience of it the ideas the the emotion the passion whatever it is it's that thing that the camera cannot give we always collaborate with the camera so I never want to dismiss it entirely but the camera is kind of a bit of a moron in terms of, you know, we're working with a collaborator that has no idea what we want to do with the photographs. So that's that's where we come in. That's where the role of curiosity and courage and patience and all of these things, discipline that I talk about in the soul of the camera. That's that's our job. That's we're the ones that put it in. People are talking about the great photographers of history, not the great cameras of history. And again, yes, the camera matters, but it is the photographer that's in the driving seat. To create compelling images, I mean, that is sort of like the the end goal, I think, of most 
advanced photographers. Would you agree? Yeah, I would hope so. Um, and when it comes down to making those compelling images, uh, you you suggest that there's got to be some way of connecting the viewer, maybe even initially the photographer, to the subject matter, and being able to have that photographer use a visual language to translate what's in, what's happening in front of her or him. Uh, what is this visual language that you talk about? Can you give us a sort of a, a small little snippet of, yeah. of what well, that might sure. look I mean, like? I mean, let's talk about it as language. I, if you were a writer, you would recognize that there are certain forms, there are certain elements of language. There's, you know, the nouns and the verbs. And, you know, without getting overly technical, um, it has nothing to do with the word processor itself, as important as that tool is, that you would figure out, okay, uh, you know, as, as you learn a language when you're a kid, you learn all the building blocks, you learn your vocabulary, you learn even so much down to the letters, right? And you spend hours writing out these letters and then it's words and vocabulary and then you put them together. And it sort of feels to me like photographers are really good at studying cameras. We know our word processor really well, but we don't know, you know, if you took 10 photographers and sat down with them and just let the conversation flow, conversation would go to the latest lens, the latest gear. Maybe it would go to something a little bit more artistic, but very rarely when you are talking about photographs with photographers, are they talking about balance and tension, contrast and juxtaposition? Very rarely are they talking about uh, the, th the elements of, you know, al aligning elements and our POV, our perspective and the role, you know, I had this guy, guy on my blog recently who basically said, composition you know you basically said composition's crap it's it's useless it's it's all the moment and i believe it is all the moment except it's your interpretation of the moment that makes it so great in the photograph if if you have the best moment in history and your pov is totally garbage and it blends that moment against a brick wall and it gets obscured or you choose the wrong shutter speed and that moment is you know, frozen at one eighth of a second. So you just get a blur. Um, all of these decisions that we make, the question is how do you give best expression to that incredible, amazing moment? And the answer is visual language tools. The answer is what kind of framing, what do you include? What do you exclude? Um, how do you use contrast? How do you use balance and tension? And again, all of these tools of the visual language the geometry and the gesture, how do you use those to give best expression? And this can apply to wedding photographers, sports photographers, landscape photographers, I mean, you name it, abstract photographers that are doing intentional camera movement, you still have to place the color and the shape and the line in such a way that we experience it and feel it. I would, I would be willing to bet that most conversations between photographers not only don't touch on that, but they don't touch on it because we're uncomfortable with the vocabulary. Whereas you talk to painters, they can talk all day long about the way colors interact, about color theory, about even you know the sh which uh, frame orientation, like the uh, the proportions of their canvas. All of this stuff gets talked about. I suspect they probably also geek out on canvases and brushes and paints but not to the exclusion of the ideas that they're painting about and the, the way that they're expressing it and the forms and the shapes and that sort of thing. So it, it sounds like it's really like, you know, nerdy on the other side of the spectrum, but the fact is if you want to make compelling photographs, the camera can't do it for you. Camera is a big part of it, but you still have to understand gesture and geometry and shape and all, all of the, the, that's the visual language. Those are the words with which we paint uh, or the words with which we write our photographs. One of the things that strikes me, David, is that all of that comes from first and foremost being intentional. And I think this is something you uh, hit upon quite a bit um, in some of your blog posts. And um, and I'm, I'm just curious, what is, is being intentional the first step or does that come after learning this language, this visual language, I mean, I'm curious what your take on that is. Yeah, I, I think it's it's it it comes at the beginning because you have to learn intentionally. I don't think we just accidentally wake up one morning with all of this stuff in our brains. Sure. Uh, clearly, we don't because the contemporary photography culture 
uh, is lacking somewhat. We're, we're strongly imbalanced. Um, you have to begin with intentionally learning this stuff, recognizing that, you know what, my visual language skills are not, uh, I don't even have the words to express uh, what I want to do here. Um, so that's, but it, it carries intention. I, I want for myself, I want to live my life. I want to practice my craft all the way through intentionally. So it begins with the with intentionally learning. One of the things that I've camped out on lately is people are people talk about it as though you know it's it's uh, you either do it intentionally or you do it like intuitively. And my argument is none of us are born with this intuitiveness. Some a little, maybe a little more so than others. Maybe more naturally able to operate in this sphere than others, but. It's like a language. It only feels intuitive right now. Like I, I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm not like, okay, pick your next word. Right. It's coming out. It feels intuitive only because I have 46 years of language it, and learning it inten very intentionally, learning how to write, learning how to craft my words, learning how to public speak. Now it feels intuitive. So for those photographers that are thinking, well, I, I just want to be intuitive. I don't want all this intentional stuff. You have to start intentional. You have to learn this stuff and ingrain it. So it goes from that front of the brain, like, oh, I got to think about it, to it's operating like an OS in the background. I'm not really thinking about it. But when I see a scene, something in the back is thinking about contrast and lines and my POV. So I would argue that it's it's both, but intention gets us there. Yes, when you're dancing, you don't want to be thinking about your footsteps. That's the best analogy. I, I'm, I'm not a dancer, but I imagine if I were, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be thinking about my, my footsteps. I, no. but, but nobody just, very few people are just naturally, they, they you know, get on the dance floor and suddenly they're doing the tango without a lesson. Starts with intention. The more we practice that, the more we study uh, in a good way. I mean, I talk about studying photographs. I don't mean sit down with a, you know, with your graph paper and, you know, I just mean look at it, ask questions of the photograph, understand why does it work? What are the lines doing? Where's, you know, what kind of emotion do I feel? What kind of story is it telling you? Why? How did the photographer do that? If we all would just study photographs more than we studied our camera manuals, we'd probably be able to make better photographs. Well, that's, that is pretty controversial. Outside. Is it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's, it seems it seems really straightforward to me. Well, I mean, I, again, I, I, it assumes you know how to use okay. the camera. Right. I, I want obviously again, it, craft matters, and I I don't dismiss that. But the minute you can capably expose and focus your camera, the stuff that is going to connect with an audience has very little or much less to do with the camera than it does with us and our decisions about composition and choice of moment. That sort of stuff is what makes strong photographs and very few people. There are some very capable people talking about it. Um, Michael Freeman comes to mind, uh, but very few photography educators are talking about this because it's easier to talk about uh, how to set up 19 softboxes and, you know, light, I, I don't know, whatever, you know, light something. <laughs> and as a result, everyone's going out and buying 19 SB 900s to light whatever that thing is. And unfortunately, uh, it's really well lit, but it's still poorly composed. There's still no choice of moment. There's no real poetry there. Someone also needs to be talking about this other stuff. Sure. One of the things you say, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to this idea of how images, uh, most images, lack soul. Um, is it because photographers tend to learn something, uh, whether it's online or through wrote memory or whatever, you know, going through a workshop here and there and just simply applying what they've learned to a T and just playing it safe. Is that an issue? Is that why people are stuck in a way, in a rut? I, I would I would say yes, absolutely it's an issue. I wouldn't say it's it is the reason people are stuck. There's a number of reasons people get stuck. Uh, but one of them is we're just not talking about this stuff. We're not uh, really talking about creativity, how to be creative. We're not talking about how to translate ideas, um, even simple ideas. I mean, I'm not talking big picture stuff. I'm not, you know, we don't have to go oh, with Gary Winogrand or, you know, like, uh, you know, artsy, fartsy stuff. I'm just talking about giving subjects, mindfully giving subjects their best expression. And very often I would, here's what I would say, Sashu, I worry that very often if a photograph is in fact, uh, and they're often not, but if it is in fact worth a thousand words, 
I'm worried we don't even have anything to say. That's that's one of my concerns. So, but that's separate too. But a lot of people do have something to say. They just they haven't been encouraged to kind of work through that. Instead of creating a body of work that has focus and depth, they're they're going here and going there, and they're shooting air shows and puppy dogs and weddings, and you know they're shooting everything they possibly can, which is awesome when you're learning. But when you get over that point and you want to start making compelling photographs uh, that say something. We can't say everything, right? You don't get people that are writing mystery novels and also haikus and specializing in, you know, metaphysical poetry and also writing user manuals for uh, computers. They 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 focus on something because that focus can take them deeper and help them master not only their tools but the things that they're trying to say and the ways in which they're saying them. Is the that was a long sermon? Hey, sorry. About yeah, that. no, I love it. I love it. Um, is the ultimate goal? to make an impact with your photography, with our photography? I wouldn't say I think there is one ultimate goal. I think everyone picks up a camera for different reasons. What I would say is for those people that, for whom that is important, that wanna make an impact, even if it's just for themselves. I think, you know, we talk about the camera a lot and I talk about the camera a lot as a vehicle of expression but often its first role is a vehicle of exploration. We just wanna see what the world looks like through the camera, see the world in a different way. But for most of us, if that's all we wanted to do, we wouldn't have to press the shutter button. We just go around with the camera and play. And that's cool, I used to do that if I couldn't afford film, I was to play. But I want to create something that does create an impact, even on that small level where someone looks at a photograph of a, fo of a bear that I've just photographed and goes, oh my God, and they feel some sort of wonder, they feel some sort of connection. Um, so yes, on some level for me, um, the, the, the more interesting question is for those that wanna create a photograph with impact, how do you do that? And that to me is where, where my attention is now going is not everyone wants to do that. Some people just wanna collect cameras. They don't want to make photographs that really are anything more than a mastery of the tool totally fine. That's just not the area I'm interested in. I am interested in the photograph and the camera as a means to getting there. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about is this idea of uh, a visual language. What would you say is the first step for a photographer to learn that visual language? And number two, how do you foresee a world where that visual language is so prevalent that we're all talking the same language finally? Well, I think on some level we are, just to, to answer the second question first, I think we are to some degree talking that language. We at least know how to listen to it because we are watching movies, we're watching films, YouTube has taken off. We are very visual creatures. Um, I don't think we actually need training to understand and absorb and experience those things. I think what's what's harder is just simply learning how to speak it with the camera in our hand. And I don't think it's that hard. Now, you mentioned intentionality. There, there are levels of, um, you know, learning. We can go really deep on things or we can just start and kind of familiarize ourselves. The best thing I would say, I have two answers. Um, the, the best thing I would say is just study great photographs, you know, instead of buying the next book about how to use your flash or you know the next thing that that i crank out um which you should buy I, everyone should buy but um once you have done that no in addition to i i think yeah. i mean i have i have books and i have shelves full of books of photographs and if i want to learn at this point um, I open up a book by Elliot Erwitt and I look at the way and I ask myself questions by study his photographs and say, boy, what do I think about that? What do I feel and why? Is it the lines? Is it the choice of moment? Is it my my point of view? Did did the did Elliot Erwitt, for example, how much did he include? What might he have excluded? Is it the use of the lens or, or the shutters? Like what elements and decisions in that photograph make me feel or think the way I do. And I just, you know, I, I'm not taking notes. I'm just absorbing and I'm thinking and I'm, and I know that there are things that I'm learning from Elliot Erwitt. My pictures don't look anything like his, but I'm learning, I learn a ton from looking at his work. And the same with, I mean, 
pick a photographer, there's something you can, even if you don't like it, liking it has nothing to do with it. So that would be the first thing. And then, you know, the second thing would just be go as deep as you can and learn the visual language itself. Um, and you know, there are a lot of ways to do this. I've just created this course that, you know, that you and I were talking about earlier that I'd love to, to talk about more. Um, but that's just that's just my way of kind of going, okay, as a teacher with an audience, I want to teach this audience this. You can learn it on your own. I mean, there are books of about visual design. There, learn about how painters compose their paintings. Learn about how visual designers design a page or architects, how they go about playing with space. And if you can play with this stuff and learn it, it will translate into your fo- into your photographs. You'll pick up a camera and you'll be more aware of those lines. You go, oh, if I move up a little bit, I'll give a little bit more uh, diagonality to these lines and therefore more energy. You'll start to think in terms of depth and energy and instead of just, well, w- how do I compose for landscapes? Well, you compose for landscapes the same way you compose for portraiture and weddings and because it's not about the person or the landscape or the iceberg or what it's about the shapes and the lines the camera doesn't see people and icebergs and bears it sees lines it sees color it sees gesture geometry all of these things if you can think like that right. no matter where you are yes some specialized knowledge is important but the actual arrangement of shape and form within the frame is um, you know that's the concern of a visual designer and that's where what we should be learning is how to do that you hinted at uh this new course that you are about to launch, or you launch, you've launched, uh, called the Compelling Frame. Talk to us a little bit about it. And what can one expect to learn from you? Well, I mean, it, it, the the focus for me was if I could get past, because I, you know, I talk about vision all the time. Sure. I mean, people yeah. hear my name and they think, oh, there's that guy that's always on about vision. Listen, you can have the, and I am, I'm still on about vision. <laughs> uh, look, I even have a T-shirt. Vision is better. It's it's on the shirt. Um, but you can have all the vision in the world right. if you don't have the visual language tools to express it it's not going to make its way into the photograph and if it does it's probably accidental you know once in a while it makes it in there and you go oh my god that's amazing and then you think how the hell did i do that right. um i created this course so that people it would become more intentional and less accidental that they they started to feel the, about their photographs the way they feel about their gear you know we all get giddy about our gear I want people to fall in love with their photographs so it's just it's a 19 lesson course primarily video based so you'll you log into your student account online and you pick your lesson and there's like a, a 10 to 15 minute video it's kind of bite-sized uh, and then there's there's written content there's key summaries and there's questions excuse me and uh, and then there's a study the masters section. So I'll show you a picture from history of you know a, a photographer that I consider to be uh, one of the masters, and say you know look at the way this person uses lines, look at the way this person uses depth, um, answer these questions about uh, how, you know the decisions that the photographer made, um, and uh, and then on top of that there's creative exercises and that sort of thing. So it's a 19 lesson course that you can kind of take at your leisure that was broken up to introduce students to the key elements of composition, of visual design, visual language, whatever you want to call it, um, and to get them asking these kind of questions. Again, I I don't care that they become really good students. I care that when they pick up the camera and they're looking through the lens that this stuff begins the journey from being really intuitive to being, uh, or sorry, really intentional to being really intuitive, and they're making photographs. And when they look at, they're going, "Oh, I love the way the lines are working in this." I love because if you can, if you can know how certain lines will be read and certain colors will make you feel, or certain light, or uh, certain juxtapositions, whatever. If you can know that, then you can begin to go, "Okay, this is my vision for a scene. This is what I feel and experience." And you can begin to translate that and, as I said, give those subjects their best expression. It just be, It's like a you're giving people the tools to be more mindful and intentional about a craft. They already know how to use those tools. Most photographers that I meet, my students, many of them know things about cameras that I will never know. I just, I, you know, they're like, so how do I adjust them? I'm like, yeah, you lost me. I'm gone. I, I, because they spend so they get when they think deeper, they're thinking deeper in terms of, you know, how do I adjust my white point in the deep in the back? And I'm like, yeah, just put it on auto white balance, man. You know, fix it in, in Lightroom. Because for me, it's not about accuracy. For me, it's about mood and feel and experience. 
what I want people to do is take all that knowledge they've got and learn to use it in terms of the photograph, which is, again, there are some people talking about this, but they're, they're, uh, they're fewer. And I just kind of felt like I'd been talking about vision so long, it was about time that I talked about the nuts and bolts of expression and you know if you ask most photographers what to you makes a compelling photograph they they, they haven't even thought about it. they want to make them yeah. but they don't even know what it looks like right sure. um, so that's part of the process what is asking them what makes a compelling photograph and then guiding them through and it's not you know it's not a super heavy course but it's it will take some time I want to go deep on this stuff mm-hmm. and so it's a bit of it's a bit of a commitment but I know because we asked a number of photographers to test this course I know that people that take it will make stronger photographs because they're learning from stronger photographs. They're looking at them and dissecting them. And so my hope is that, you know, I love this craft. I just want people to be less frustrated. I want people to, instead of going, oh my God, I love my Nikon D850, whatever, fine. But I also want them to be going, oh my God, like look at the print I just made. I never imagined, because that's the magic I felt when I first started it. And I want others to feel that. And I think, uh, it's much more of a living, breathing thing than these cameras. Because let's face it, your camera, the camera you're in love with today, yes. uh, next next year, it's going to be, oh, that old crappy thing. I don't know why I bought that, right? That, there will always be a new magic bullet. I want people to 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 be in love with something that's going like, to have a legacy and these photographs and these experiences. Because when you're at the end of our lives, Sashi, we're not going to be thinking fondly about the cameras we had. So true. Right? So true. Right? We're going to be thinking about the stories and the memories and the experiences, the things that we are making photographs of. And I think, you know, I can have a great experience. And sometimes without the camera, it, it will grow in my mind and the story will become incredible. But also, if I look back 10 years from now, there are things I would have forgotten otherwise if I didn't have a photograph. And if I have a really really compelling photograph even if it's just for me that memory is much more compelling so in that way photography enriches our lives and I just you know it yeah I want people's lives to be or their photographs to be better but actually what I really want is for their lives to be richer you know there's an there's enough pain and and misery going on in this world I I just want people you know instead of being frustrated I want my students to come up to me instead of going oh god I can't figure out how to I want them to come up with that picture and go Oh my God, look at this. And share that with me because when you show me how you see the world, I experience the world in a richer kind of way. So that's a little bit too, uh, too poet warrior for, uh, for some people, but <laughs> no, take it but, or leave it. But this is a great way of, of talking about, um, you know, not only just the course that you're offering, but also, you know, I've always wondered why does somebody pick up the camera in the first place? Why? Mm. What is it that drives them to, to want to say something, anything? Uh, and what is it? What is it that they're going to use from their past, their experiences in the past, to make a, a stronger photograph? And it's not easy. Uh, I'll give you an example. My, my, I have a cousin who is very interested in photography, and he he just, you know, dove in and bought a camera, and he's excited, and all the things that we've already talked about, you know. And uh, he'd asked me over uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, he said, "Seishu, how do I how do I create a silhouette?" You know, now you and I know how to do that, and it comes intuitively because we've done it in the past once or twice. Uh, but he, for him, it is a, it is a source of excitement. You know, it mm-hmm. is a it is a source of uh, wanting to learn more and wanting to maybe conquer that part of the the process that he hasn't yet figured out. But mm-hmm. question is, I guess, does he move on to what? What does he move on to? You know, well, I mean, once you, that's a device, you've learned right. to create a silhouette, you've learned how to backlight, you've learned. So great. Now you have a tool, you have a device that when you are in a place like, you know, I'm just packing my bags to go to to go to Venice for a couple of weeks of workshops and you're in this place and you're feeling this certain thing and the light is really, really hard. And and you go, oh, my God, a silhouette would work great here as you start playing you and then you know how to do it so rather than then in that situation going oh crap how do I how do I make a silhouette you go ah I remember how to do this I'm going to throw my camera onto manual I'm going to underexpose it by three to five stops I'm going to look at my histogram go boom I've got a silhouette great right and then you start to play but 
it, we're, we're learning how it's just like getting really good at combining a series of words and verbs and going, oh, okay, now I've mastered rhyming, now I can make a poem. So you're just learning the thing. But most of us get way more excited about making a great photograph that uses silhouette than just figuring out how to make silhouettes. That's exciting. Learning the tool is like, yes, I can do it. But why we're excited is the potential. Like, oh my God, now I can actually combine this with a couple of other things and I can make a photograph that is maybe more about the shape or the gesture than it is about the particular details. You know, I, I when I teach, I have this picture of a, a, cam a camel in silhouette and it's beautiful, it's moody, it's uh, it's orange sky, it's sunset, and it's beautiful. No one's ever looked at that silhouette of the camel and gone, oh, you know, you want to expose this by three stops. Like, there's no detail in the camel. Like, who cares which camel it is, right? Yeah. It's more important that, that I had the shape of the camel than the details of the camel. And it was definitely way more important that I had the color of the sky, which I could only accomplish by underexposing. If you understand this, you know how, the, you know the tools in which to, by which you can make a more compelling photograph. The one that we just look at that color and that shape and go, ah, oh, I feel, rather than going, okay, what kind of camel is it? The sky is all bleached out. There's no color in it. It's just a picture of a crappy camel. You know how to use the tool. You then, or if you know um, what the tool is capable of and how to use it, right. then when the situation arises, you can make a photograph that is appropriately compelling. Indeed, indeed. David, uh, this has been a fascinating chat with you about everything really that I wanted to talk about in terms of language, visual language, and making impactful photographs. Uh, folks can learn more about your upcoming course, The Compelling Frame, in a link that I'll link to, link to below. Um, anything else you'd like to add or share with uh, my audience in terms of who this, is, this course might be for or... What what else they could learn? Yeah, from I mean, sure. I mean, thank you. With, without uh, without you know being too salesy because I don't think that's uh, that's the point. Um, the the course is really for everyone. If you can focus your camera and expose your camera, this is not you know I've had people say, well, I've got a, I've got this camera. Is the course it's for if you use an iPhone, it's it, you can you can use this course because it's not about the camera. It's about photographs. It's about visual design. It's about composition. So uh, as long as you can expose and focus your camera, you're on your way. You don't need specialized equipment. It, like I said, an iPhone is fine. Um, I think that the two things that I would say is, um, it, one, the, the course is only open for a week. Enrollment in the course is, uh, is from September 13th to the 20th. And I don't want people kind of feeling like they've, m well, I don't want people missing out thinking, oh, I'll just wait until next month. Um, so if you're interested, go to the compelling frame.com, take a look at the details. The other thing I would say is one of the things that we're doing with this course, because there's only so much I can do and there's not like a ton of, you're not going to be doing homework and then getting my appraisal on it. It's not super interactive that way. Although there is some interactivity, what I'm doing is instead is creating something called the vision driven. And it's a Facebook, a closed Facebook community where people can, they'll get a one year free membership and they can go on and they can not only look at other photographs and contribute to conversations and learn how to critique photographs and talk about composition, but there will be biweekly assignments and there will be a continuation of my study the masters series. So it was sort of like, you know, you get the course, you work through it, but then there's also sort of, uh, if you choose, there's a way for us. Let me back up. The, the one thing, Sashu, that people continually tell me, I get all these emails going, David, the, my biggest challenge is that I can't get good feedback on my photographs. I either get um, a total apathy from people or I get, hey, that's really great. Good capture, man. And there's no depth to it. So the vision driven is a place for people that want a uh, very kind, very compassionate uh, community, but that are willing to say, you know what? I see what you're trying to do here with this photograph. Um, I don't really, it doesn't make me feel anything. And here's what I suspect contributes to that. And have you tried this? And what would have happened if you'd done this? So I'm going to be encouraging, um, on one level, a very kind ruthlessness where we um, agree that the point is to improve our craft, not to feed our egos. And if you're looking for that kind of feedback, that's my hope with this community. Of course, the strength of any community is its members, so we'll see how it pans out. But I will be curating it and I will be in there 
giving new assignments and saying, okay, I think I really think, you know, for example, if I look at your photograph and just say, hey, I love the way the lines are working in this, but would they have been stronger if you'd got a little bit lower or moved a little to your left or used a wider lens in conjunction with those decisions? So um, those are, are sort of the two things I would leave with you for the, anyone that is thinking about the course. Um, those are sort of the two, and there's a bunch of other bonuses. There's some other bonus videos and there's a whole lot of stuff, but I think the community is where people are going to get a ton of value. Um, and if you're interested in this, uh, go, go now-ish because it will close at, uh, you know, 11:59 on the 20th of September, uh, Seattle, Vancouver, Los Angeles time. Awesome. Thanks again, David. My pleasure. Thank you, Sashu. Take care. Ciao.